University of Virginia. Hi. So, um, hello, everybody. Good morning. Thank you, Amitai, for being the reason for all of us to meet and discuss, and thank you for your uh, lecture. Uh, I want to present today a study uh, which is a collaboration between uh, um, uh, three researchers, uh, Michael uh, here, uh, myself, and um, Irit Hadar from the University of Haifa, from the Information Systems Department. Uh, and this is um, an uh, ISF, an Israeli National, um, sorry, uh, Israeli Science uh, Foundation uh, project. Uh, and um, I would also like to, to thank the students who, who do most of the empirical stuff that we see here. Uh, Oshat Elon, sitting over here, um, Tomer, Tomer Hasson, which isn't here, and Arod, which is over there. So thank you guys. Okay. So uh, the idea of this project is actually looking at what engineers are doing in privacy. And the starting point is an initiative called Privacy by Design. So privacy by design is becoming very fashionable in, the, in recent years, mainly in legal circles. And that's the idea that uh, instead of regulating on top of what corporations, governments, uh, organizations are already doing, uh, we should encourage them to build privacy into the system that they already uh, build. To, um, uh, for example, to have privacy is the default option when you start using a system, or to um, limit in a technological way the time that uh, data is saved, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this initiative started at technological uh, circles uh, by, for example, papers by uh, Lang, uh, Lang Heinrich, and then moved very, in a very thorough way into legal circles. Um, and uh, um, the whole idea of this initiative is to communicate with engineers to convince them to that privacy would work for them, and uh, uh, to develop methods, systems, architectures that support privacy. The problem is that we really don't have very good, I'm, I'm sorry about the writing, we just moved between computers and may, maybe the formatting will, will be compromised, that. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, sorry for that. But um, uh, currently we don't have many good examples of privacy by design working. We have several examples, for example, uh, this paper uh, uh, showing that it doesn't in many cases. And uh, when we look at empirical studies, for example, the one uh, by Byers and, and other researchers of implementing privacy by design methods like P3P, if some, if there are several of these technologies, uh, we see very low, low adaption. And we wonder why. And other people also wonder why. So if we have privacy and information systems, and now I want to limit the talk to, not to every aspect of privacy, but many aspects of privacy. I want to limit the talk to privacy in information systems, and mainly information systems that, that are run by corporations, rather than government, uh, because uh, um, uh, it kind of simplifies our problem. So why privacy by, desi by design doesn't work? One reason is that it's just, uh, and not something that users are willing to do something about. So well, we have this very well-known phenomenon called uh, uh, the privacy paradox, where the perceptions of privacy and the actual behavior taken by users are very different. So this is one explanation, even though we see that in many very important fields of information systems, like in social network networks, we see that people are actually very active in pursuing privacy, changing their privacy settings, uh, managing what information they share. Uh, we also see that in other types of systems, uh, mobile systems. And in a sense, when technology moves into the hands of the people, we see more involvement uh, in, in actual privacy. But that's, of course, one, one explanation. But it's not all. Another explanation is, of course, that it's bad for business. Privacy is bad for business. Okay? This is something that we hear uh, uh, all the time. And of course, there's, there's lots of truth in it. And uh, there are many, many companies that make money out of violating privacy or out of using the data in ways that, that Amitai, for example, explained. Uh, but again, this doesn't tell the whole story because we see, for example, uh, in places like when we compare Europe and the US, the legal frameworks are very different uh, in, in, in those uh, uh, continents. Uh, 
and, uh, and of course what, pe what engineers do with privacy is different, but we don't see um, the emergence of new technological architectures that support privacy in Europe. When there are some laws, like in the, the new cookie law in England, for example, the one that showed, that showed the, you know, the cookie messages in, uh, in English websites, people implement that, but we don't see a shift in the culture. So what else? So our uh, project is based on the idea that there's one population that people didn't look at, and that's engineers. Okay, the actual people building the systems. And uh, uh, this is uh, the population that we're focusing on, and uh, we want to look specifically at information systems engineers. Those are the people who, are build, who build the um, mobile applications and websites and uh, enterprise management systems that we see here in the university and other places. And let me try to convince you that engineers are indeed important to privacy. And again, this, this, isn't, this isn't something that we need to take for granted because you can think about engineers as just people who, you know, they, you know, the business people come to them, they give them some requirements for a new system and then they just implement it. But we think engineers are doing a little more than that. So a couple of things on, on why uh, engineers uh, are important. First of all, engineers are very um, kind of, there's a culture of engineering. So I'm coming from this culture of, culture of engineering, but basically many of engineers uh, learn the same programming language, uh, go to universities, colleges, or take courses. For example, most of Israeli software engineers uh, are, uh, get some training, for example, in the army. And uh, they collaborate in, a very, in, in very interesting ways, for example, through online forums, um, um, places like Stack Exchange, for example, if somebody know something about it. Uh, and there's lots of um, um, knowledge moving between them. Uh, and many of the things that they do is based on kind of the culture of engineering. Another thing is that engineers think in frameworks. So now almost all the systems we use are based on this idea of a technological architecture called client-server, where we have the client, that's the, for example, mobile device, and then we have the server somewhere in the cloud. And if you build a new system, you will build it on a client-server uh, uh, platform just because that's the most widely used um, uh, architecture. But client server is actually very bad for privacy because all the information is centralized. Some systems don't have to be built on the client server architecture, but this is a culture that engineers do. This is an architecture which is very widely uh, adopted. So understanding what engineers do, what the kind of architecture, the kind of decision making uh, um, they have could lead us to build better frameworks. Maybe better frameworks for privacy that will actually be able to sustain privacy by design. Okay, so what do we do? So in the study we do four things. Uh, I think that we're almost finishing two of them and starting the, the next two. We're actually in the middle of the project. So one thing, uh, yeah, so one thing is discourse analysis. This is a very fun thing. This is a draft of paper that um, 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 Michael had headed, but all of us um, participated. And that's actually reading, doing some old-fashioned discourse analysis, uh, post-modern discourse analysis on engineering books. And this is one of the, the first times that everybody had done that. I'm going to show that in, the, in a second. Next thing, we're doing interviews. We're interviewing, um, um, we're now finishing a paper. Uh, we're interviewing about 30 engineers. You know, information systems engineer trying to understand how they perceive and act on privacy and I'm going to present that. The next steps which we didn't do uh, yet is to um, assess in a, quali in, a, sorry, in a qualitative way um, something we call privacy climate. I'm going to talk about it in, 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 uh, in a second. Oh well. And uh, the last thing is we're going to do some surveys. So I'm going to really quickly go through some of the results. So let's start with the discourse analysis. So what the thing that we've done here is actually we've read two types of papers. We've read FIPS books. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Words, texts. Uh, so we've read um, um, we've read the fair fair information practices principle principle practices. This is the main body of of legal. Uh, a framework for privacy, but we've read it as if it was a programming guide. So we try to understand what kind of programming and architectural decision they've done 
uh, in, when writing the law. And we've read the engineering textbooks and we've uh, focused on um, data warehouses, which are big organizational databases used in almost every large organization today. And we try to understand what's a privacy mindset in there. And of course, uh, uh, the differences are pretty staggering, but I want to focus on the architectural elements. So if we look at the um, uh, law's technological mindset, we see that they work, first of all, they, they at least based on the, the ideas on anonymity. And then uh, uh, if anonymity doesn't, uh, um, um, can't be uh, implemented, then they mainly base the idea of privacy on a transaction architecture, which means that uh, there's some sort of an electronic transaction. For example, you, you buy something on the internet, and uh, this transaction has some specific goals, and uh, uh, they request your specific consent for doing this transaction. But when you look at data warehousing uh, texts, then the idea is very different. First of all, their default is that people are identified and are profiled. And um, they look at aggregative architecture rather than a transactional based one, which means that there's a big, one big database. All the data goes into the, this database. You collect data before you know what you're going to do with this because this is uh, because maybe you would think about better ways to use the data in the future, and then uh, uh, um, um, you build new applications on top of this database. So this is something we actually uh, we have a draft for this paper and uh, Michael is circulating it. The next thing is we asked uh, we interviewed 30 uh, um, information system participants. And we ask them, the first question is, how do they perceive privacy? And we, catalog, we, we categorize their perceptions according to the fair information uh, practices principles. And most of them think about privacy mainly in terms of what we call security. So they think about privacy as protecting the users from people from the outside. But the ones who own the system, who run the system, uh, in most cases aren't perceived as a privacy threat. So it's kind of a, an outside view of privacy. Uh, and um, I'm going to skip that because I don't have uh, lots of time, I'm sorry. Um, when we ask them what kind of technologies they use, it's, it's very similar. So um, um, the darker blue ones show what technologies they actually use. So everybody uses encryption, which is the cornerstone of privacy. But when we look at, for example, temporal data, okay, which, is, which is the idea that Amitai had mentioned, where you keep data only for a very short period of time, this, this has been used uh, and also uh, um, uh, understood in uh, um, much less proportions. Um, another thing we try to understand is who is responsible? Who is responsible for privacy? And um, I, I'm, I'm cherry picking here, okay? it's, it's not really fair. Some of the people um, uh, uh, consider themselves, themselves as responsible for privacy, but uh, almost all of them, 25 of them, didn't do that. And to be clear, these are the people who make the decisions about how the system is getting built, where the de data goes, when the data is being deleted, and they either push privacy to lawyers, this isn't those quotes here, but this, this, this happens in our text, or they push privacy to security, okay? Um, but uh, they don't, at least the guys that we've interviewed, uh, don't think about privacy as something that is in the realm of the architectural decisions we make. Okay, last thing is that, uh, that we've seen is that there's, there's, there's lots of differences between different organizations. And we try to use the term privacy climate in the scope of uh, development and engineering organizations. So for example, this, this, this guy over here um, uh, had worked in two very different organizations. One of them was a healthcare organization where privacy was actually um, um, well uh, perceived and, and, uh, and managed. And the other was a telecommunication organization where it just, yeah, it's just nothing. Yeah, it's surprising. Yeah, yeah.
Yeah, all of them. All of them are Israelis. Okay. Although um, some of the companies are American. Yeah. A regulator um, in in communication. There's a lot of there's lots of work, lots of work, uh, uh, and um, uh, we see lots of evidence showing how um, how the climate of privacy um, channels through to the engineers. And um, for the future, we try to build a model of privacy climate very much like like the model existing in, for example, work safety. So there's lots of uh, work in uh, um, uh, looking at how the climate of the organization controls uh, or affects the work safety in the organization. That's what we do. So uh, our next step is to build a survey, a large-scale survey that tries to look at that. And um, um, the, the last thing that we need to do in th this project is actually try to survey uh, and understand where engineers learn about privacy. Where did they hear about it? Was it their education, media, um, how things work off? That's Thank it. Thank you.